Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola, and welcome to this broadcast. Uh, before I get going and introduce the guest for uh, the show for today, I would just like to ask you and invite you to become a subscriber to the Descender newsletter, support the journalism that we do here, and also make sure you subscribe to the channel. Get alerts when we're going to go live and have the kind of conversation that you'll be hearing today. Uh, and if you're motivated and actually believe in the work that is done here and what you're listening to, uh, maybe consider joining the channel. And there's some exclusive content. We're doing more recordings and shows here on the channel these days. So this is a good way to support independent journalism if you're really serious about not just uh, all the pollution out there from the prestige or establishment media. So with that said, I would like to bring in our guest uh, and uh, have him join me. So here is Matthew Ho, and Matthew is with the Eisenhower Media Network. He's also a longtime peace activist. Also last year, you ran as a Green Party Senate candidate in North Carolina. So thanks for joining, Matthew. Hey, thanks, Kevin. It's good to see you. And um, over here, uh, again, uh, we'll be talking about this um, and how you, uh, around the time that we were all digesting the anniversary of one year of war in Ukraine, um, you went forward and organized a group letter that was published in the New York Times about the U.S. and how it should be a force for peace in the world, um, advocating for diplomacy, deliberate diplomacy rather than deliberate war making, which is what we typically see from our government. Um, but I just want to, uh, just a kind of programming note, you know, right now, uh, and also because I don't believe that we should go about our daily lives and pretend like it isn't happening around us. I just want to mention that at the moment, the last two days, it has been unhealthy and hazardous for anyone to leave their home here in Chicago and other cities of its affected states. Pretty much um, any any state that is um, on this latitude from, uh, well, it's been almost all of the Great Lakes states. I know Detroit has been hit badly. Pittsburgh, uh, some of this air, I believe, is now making its way to the East Coast. Uh, this is all from wildfire smoke in uh, Canada. And since, you know, we tend to look at things through the lens of military, uh, I know that Joe Biden has said, well, we're sending a, a few hundred or so U.S. soldiers uh, to Canada to help fight the wildfires there, which are about as uh, bad as they have ever been in Canada. Now, I'm no expert on what needs to be done to control this, but I do know that it's a result of the climate emergency of the, the, the way in which we're seeing things that are out of control. But uh, as we, as you listen to us talk today, and I, I suppose you can respond to this if you'd like, Matthew, uh, I'm just thinking of how we create all these problems through war making when the amount of resources and funds and everything that we have available could be put towards fighting this war, because this is a war. This is something that is going to kill and make people sick, and there needs to be resources applied to fighting its impact. Right. I, I think um, the idea of what we're up against and what we will be up against, this is just a precursor. This is, uh, you know, one of the things I think that that bothers a lot of us is that occasionally, not occasionally, it's almost every year, a report comes out from uh, various groups, uh, organizations, the UN, uh, attesting to what's happening with, with the climate. And invariably, they say, we've gotten it wrong. And, and what they're talking about is that the models were too conservative. The models were, were, were not accurate enough. The models did not take into account uh, the escalatory effects, the reinforcing effects of climate change as it gets hotter, as it gets wetter. Well, that means, you know, and so that type of, of runaway climate catastrophe what we're looking at. And so you see that, you know, annually scientists saying we got it wrong, but not meaning they got it wrong in a good way. Everything's going to be OK, meaning they got it wrong in a sense that, you know, we really uh, uh we underestimated how quickly the climate is changing. 
And of course, as you said, the resources. Well, first, the, the role of the military and wars playing in climate change. You know, the biggest, biggest uh, uh, institutional polluter in the world is the U.S. military. And the U.S. military, and I think all militaries, are generally excluded from any types of climate talks, any types of agreements. They were excluded from the Paris agreements. You know, whenever you have, um, you know, the, the, the annual gathering the, of, of, of uh, uh, the COP gatherings, uh, the conference of party gatherings to discuss the climate, uh, the military is off the table. And when you have someone like Abby Martin confront Speaker Pelosi at the COP gathering last year, uh, is Speaker Pelosi says, oh, yes, what a great threat the climate is to the military, as opposed to understanding, appreciating and having the honesty to say what a threat the military is to the climate. Uh, you know, if, if in, in then, of course, why do we have these wars and the relationships between the banks, the fossil fuel companies, the arms companies and the military? You know, you get this uh, a foundation that just ensures that underwrites uh, these wars, uh, whichever nation seems to be uh, launching them. So it is. And then they get to the idea about the resources as you described. And maybe at some point, if we had saner leadership, if we had some type of uh, rational collective response to this climate catastrophe, we would be talking about converting our B-52s and B-1s uh, and B-2s and the new B-21 bombers, which when you put all, we do all the math together, that this next generation of bomber plane, the B-21 Raider, uh, they're going to buy a hundred of them for $200 billion. So you do the math, that's $2 billion per airplane. Right. The sticker price is something like 600 or 700 million. But when you add it all together, it comes out to about two billion with all the research, development, maintenance, logistics, training, I'll add it all in. So what if we were to convert those from bombers into tankers? And so rather than our B-52s right now uh, getting staged in the Pacific uh, for a war with China or being sent over to Europe to participate in these uh, this massive aerial war game that's going on right now in Europe. Uh, what if they were used to take on the Canada wildfires, right? You know, how many people in the United States lives will be saved? How many in Canada will be saved? How many worldwide will be saved just from that one incident? If we were able to get these things under control, if we were to use all the resources, the nearly $900 billion that the Defense Department gets every year, right? So, yeah, there's a lot that we could be doing here that we're not. And the danger, of course, is just absolutely, well, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's apocalyptic. Uh, in the sense that uh, it will uh, it will have an effect on our society and our civilization, unlike anything else ever has. Right. I, and uh, as you're as you're talking, I'm reminded that this smoke is entering European mm -hmm. airspace, and and, right. and that's something that they have to contend with. Of course, you know these people who are in, let's say, the United Kingdom or these Scandinavian countries. It's not like they live nearby. It's not easy for them to provide support for Canada. So if Canada says, well, we're stretched and we really don't know what to do and we're doing the best that we can to take on these fires, there's really no international response group organized to help deal with this. And then I'm also, in a nationalistic sense, um, taken aback by how much uh, we've gloated over the last 20, 25 years when, let's say, China, particularly Beijing, you've seen images of their air quality. People have right. you know, patted themselves on the back and made it seem like, OK, we've really got the best society possible. Look at what's happening in China. And then you go to look at your city and find out that you have and Chicago at one point was the worst pollution in the world at one point earlier earlier this week so you know to me i i just sit back and go well who's china now who, who well it looks like we are and there's really something more that we need to be doing because to me like i do know that there might be a certain phenomenon element to what we're seeing here where there are some things that are sort of out of our control but i don't accept that there isn't anything that we could do i just get angry at the amount of inaction and the lack of urgency and and how, you know, just very casual. Even earlier this year when it was in D.C. and there was smoke 
and you hear just only a handful of people get angry, mostly no impact on Capitol Hill. It's, no, it's mm -hmm. not a catalyst for action. It's just kind of like, oh, that happened. Uh, the weather forecast will change tomorrow and we'll be we'll be OK. Well, I, I think there's two aspects of that. There's the grift that that right underwrites it all, underlies it all. Right. Where uh, in order to go along and get along in Congress, in state houses, even on local town councils, um, you have to be funded. And so if you want your political career to go forward uh the least you can do is not make waves, not make enemies. So even if you're not accepting money from the fossil fuel industry, you're not taking money from B Bank of America or Wells Fargo, you know, any of the banks that make obscene profits off the fossil fuel industry. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, and you're not concerned that Exxon Mobil's biggest customer is the Department of Defense. Uh, as just as long as you're not making waves. Right. Let alone if you're going to take the money. But then the other thing, too, is that most of the people who are in these positions going from, again, town councils up through Congress are wealthy people. And I think the understanding that they have is that they are going to be OK. Uh, they view climate change. If they if they study it, they view it as something that will not be apocalyptic in the sense of a plague where, you know, uh, nine out of 10 people die. Rather, it will cause massive economic, societal, infrastructural uh, catastrophes that will bring about mass migration, collapse of, of you know, uh, societal structures, et cetera. But as long as you have the money, you're going to be OK. And I think that's what we're up against. We're, we're up against uh, one, a system that has there's no benefit in doing something about this approaching uh, or we're in the, we're in it. But it's nascent right now. What we're dealing with, we've we've seen nothing yet. But then the other side is, is so the one don't anger the, 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 you know, don't bite the hand that feeds you kind of thing. Uh, but then also, too, these people, by and large, I think they believe they are going to be OK. It might cost them some extra money, but as long as they are at the top, as long as they are elevated, right, they will be on the proverbial hill while the rest of the people are down below drying, uh, die, you know, drowning, uh, you know, uh, uh, not able to breathe, uh, running away from wildfires, et cetera. Yeah, they'll just be going on their Ocean Gate expeditions and, right. and blasting off into space and going around orbiting the Earth, looking down on the destruction and marveling at it. Uh, right, all right, right. so I mean, and, and there's yeah. some sci fi out there, right? There is that I can't remember the name of the film, but that was that Matt Damon film about oh, yeah, Elysium, Elysium, yeah, right? Yeah. Where that is that's basically what you're talking about. Maybe not, maybe they won't be in this massive spaceship right but they'll be in gated communities right they'll well, be protected yeah. by mercenary forces right by police forces they will own everything and then those outside the gates are the ones who are going to be living in the low-lying areas that flood they'll be living in the towns that are collapsing because of the excess rain they'll be living in the uh you know communities that can't get uh, uh, food at a decent price because there's been crop collapse everywhere on and on and on, you know, but they'll be okay. I think is how they view it. Yeah. We have someone uh, tuning in who says um, we have a stupid president who refuses to declare a climate emergency. Smoke has engulfed my town from the Canadian wildfires. I'm back to wearing a mask. Um, I just have a lot of empathy and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I just feel for what you're going through. Uh, I'm going to move on to, why I initially invited Matthew to come on the show before this pollution took over a region of the United States. I, um, you wrote a, a couple articles over at your, let me put this up. Um, uh, sorry, wrong one. Uh, you have a sub stack Matt's thoughts on war and peace. Um, I've got it up there and you have a couple articles that you have been putting out. There's at least one more coming in this series. It says, uh, a war long wanted. Many in Brussels, D.C., Kiev, London, and Moscow have desired this war for d decades. Obviously talking about the war in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, I wanted to give you, a, I wanted to talk with you about all of this. So you know, just to begin the discussion here, uh, what we're talking about is how uh, essentially there is this history that has led up to the war in Ukraine. You do a good job of summarizing all of the events that have led up to it. 
So, you know, take an opportunity to get into some of this deliberate decision making that you believe made this war, uh, well, I guess not only inevitable, but also made it clear that if the, ever the climate supported having this war, the U.S. government was going to be more inclined to allow it than prevent it from happening. Correct. You know, what we what we and, and uh, the other folks you showed early on, the ad we ran in the New York Times last month, uh, which basically alleges diplomatic malpractice. Uh, we ran another ad this week in The Nation magazine, a truncated version of that same thing as well, uh, allowing us to make the argument that, uh, you know, the the absence of diplomacy, the deliberate absence of diplomacy or the diplomatic malpractice, because diplomacy was being utilized for decades since the end of the Cold War over the Ukraine question, over the NATO expansion question, over arms control questions, over a host of issues. Uh, the diplomatic uh, activity that was occurring was done not to seek uh, uh, rapprochement, not to seek any type of, of uh, consolation, not to ensure uh, a form of peace, but that led to a war. Whether or not you want to say it was inevitable that this, that this war came about, I, I'll differ with that. I have another piece up uh, that, you know, says that the war was not inevitable, that there were options that were available. Uh, right, 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 right. Right. You know, I mean, so I, I think what's interesting that we get a lot of pushback on and this comes out of, uh, I think, our larger political argumentation or larger political discussions, the, the structure we have for talking uh, politics, world events, history in, in this country is, is very much uh, formulated in the way. I talk about the New York Mets, you know, I mean, like in what you have, though, is you have this if you come forward as myself and others and, and many people have been saying this for years, too. So it's not like uh, we are special in any way, any way. But if you advocate a third position, if you advocate uh, that uh, 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 diplomacy, if you uh, say that both sides have their share of blame, that this is a war wanted by both sides, uh, that there were other options, uh, you know, the incredulous, how incredulous people are towards that. And then the emotion, the anger that comes with it. I, I've been speaking against U.S. wars publicly for 13 and a half years now, writing about this stuff. You know, um, I've never seen an atmosphere like this, even when I was speaking against say, the war in Afghanistan or we'd speak against the war in Syria. I was never hit with, uh, well, that means you are supporting the Taliban. Right. That yeah. means you are supporting the Islamic State. That starts to differ, actually, with Syria, where you start getting hit with your you're favoring Assad. It, you know, it, now, though, the, ha, try and have a conversation in the U.S. media, in the European media. Uh, and uh, the same, too, I get the collective West, as it's called, to throw in the Korea, Korea throw in Korea. So I mean, South Korea, Japan, New Zealand, Australia to have this conversation. And have to at first explain how you're not in favor of one side or the other and that you were in favor of a negotiated settlement to end this war, that this war is disastrous, that no matter how big you think the white hat is that your side is wearing, that this war will overcome your moral righteousness and utilize that for its own purposes. I mean, wars are essentially a, a force of nature. I mean, talking in a figurative sense, right? But in the sense that it's uncontrollable by man uh, and by humankind and by our societies. And that when you do go into war, and I can test this personally, you think you're going to be a moral agent. You think that around you, you are going to do good or you won't do wrong. Well, the war is going to make you an agent of its own immorality. It is just the nature. And so when you look at this war and you see it's stalemated, you see that there's a very real serious danger of escalation uh, that could lead to a, 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 a nuclear apocalyptic third world war. I, mean, I don't like that I've said apocalyptic like three or four times already in this conversation. You know, when you look at that, right, and you say, well, okay, there's got to be another way out of this. But the problem is, is when you try and discuss that other way out of this, when you try and discuss negotiated settlement, ceasefire, truce, negotiations, a deal, uh, even though that's the way almost all wars end, hmm. you are shouted down as either being a, a, a Putin apologist or uh, a, an advocate for NATO imperialism. Now, I, I think, though, maybe that's when you know you're, you're at a good spot, Kevin. I know you, you've dealt with this. When both sides are yelling at you, 
when you write something and you're immediately criticized for being a Kremlin agent at the same time uh, that you're criticized for being a, a, a tool of the Biden administration, uh, I think maybe you're on a good path there uh, to fighting an outcome uh, or help trying to find an outcome, offering a solution, trying to explain things in a manner that delves and separates and gets rid of all uh, the partisanship in this and tries to find some principled way forward. Uh, because the suffering, the destruction that's going on in Ukraine is just as real as the suffering destruction that went on in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, uh, Libya, Yemen, Somalia, uh, you know, all throughout Africa. Uh, you know, uh, so it, it, it's the, what we're up against in trying to argue for a way forward out of this war that's not partisan. Uh, it's really quite startling how vitriolic the, the resistance of that has been. Yeah. Now, generally, I would agree with you um, with the little asterisk that, unfortunately, what you're saying, un it conjures my memory of how Barack Obama would dismiss criticism by basically saying that he had split the difference and right. done the best possible compromise. And, and he always had this sense that, like, nobody should be happy with what was coming out of Congress, um, which I, I kind of resent that entirely but I, but another figure who i do entertain is uh lula president lula yeah. in brazil and, and they've taken a position of neutrality and, and they've actually yeah. been attacked viciously for refusing to take sides when it comes to the war in ukraine and uh so far as i can tell they haven't entirely gone and become an ally of Russia. And they've also resisted supporting any shipments of weaponry that could be used by Ukrainians against Russian military. They just want to be neutral. And they generally believe that what's happening is a failure of the West and Russia to maintain peace. And I think that that's the correct position. And right. you know, you write in your piece, it is morally not possible to endorse the strategy of fighting Russia to the last Ukrainian, nor is it moral to be silent as our nation pursues strategies and policies uh, with goals that are basically unachievable. I mean, this idea that we've heard from Joe Biden that we're going to fight to the last Ukrainian sounds good on the battlefield, but it's not really realistic. And, and, and also, I think it's a really good way to just end up sacrificing an entire population that hasn't really prepared itself for what enemy forces are able to counter with in this battle, in this unfolding war. Well, I, I think, you know, you look at this a, a few different ways in the sense that, you know, myself and many others, uh, you know, I've been, have spent the last 25 years of my life engaged professionally with war, either taking part in it or, or arguing against it, fighting against it. And, you know, I look at this war and many others do as well. Just in estimation is that Ukraine cannot physically remove Russia from its territory. It doesn't have the size. It doesn't have the industrial base. It doesn't have the weapons. Uh, the U.S. and uh, NATO do not have the industrial capacity to produce the weapons and the munitions and the equipment that, that uh, Ukraine would need, you know, on and on and on. In order to physically eject Russia from Ukraine's territory will require a NATO army. And when I say an army, I mean an army in the traditional sense of, of, the, of the, or the specific sense of the term army, three to five core of armor and infantry units, uh, plus all the, uh, uh, you know, attendant uh, naval, air, rocket, missile uh, support that you would need with that. I mean, so you're talking about an army of hundreds of thousands, and that's just not going to happen. And so what you're, you're looking at then is you're then saying if that is your, your solution to this war, victory in Ukraine. Uh, victory for Ukraine and the, reje the ejection of, of Russia from Ukraine's borders, it's just not going to happen. And so what are you then doing? You're condemning Ukraine to a war that it cannot win. Now, I also believe that Russia cannot win this war either. I, I don't believe Russia has the ability to do much more than it has done already. I don't think it has the ability to push farther into Ukraine. It might at some point over the next year or two take an extra 20, 30, 40 miles. But I don't think it has the forces. I don't think it has the the depth, the, the structures 
to push on and take, say, Kiev, let alone all the way to the Polish border. Uh, and if they did, well, I don't think they want to anyway, because that would then incur a hostile occupation of central and, Uc of central and western Ukraine that would be reminiscent of the U.S. occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, what I mean, so why would they even want to jump into that quicksand? So, you know, I mean, neither side is able to win. And if you are then in a stalemate where neither side can win, it becomes a conflict that uh, resembles the second half of the Korean War, say, where uh, the U.S. and U.N. and South Korean forces against the North Korean and Chinese forces spent about 18 months or so just fighting out of trenches. So very similar to World War I, if you want, as well, where neither side can win unless something happens, as in World War I, where Russia leaves the war, the U.S. enters the war, uh, you know, things like that occur that dramatically change uh, the nature or the, 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 how the war actually is, the reality of the war. Uh, in this case, what would, be, what would be that? What would be the thing that would change the stalemate? And that would be escalation. And so now you're looking at an escalatory uh, conflict, uh, something that has scared the hell out of a lot of people, rightfully so. Look, my boss, He's uh, he spent his career in the Air Force. Uh, he, well, he, he spent his time at the Pentagon, at Space Command, at NORAD. He was around the nuclear missile uh, uh, leadership. Right. So always that was where he was always working or worked a lot of the time. Uh, I don't think he'd mind. I'll say he's 66 years old. You know, and again, his career, his life has been around those types of weapons. And he's never been so scared in his life. I mean, so this gives a lot of people very serious pause that the only way out of this conflict in terms of a victory is through escalation. And where is that escalation likely going to lead? I mean, so this brings you back then to the idea that, OK, you have to negotiate a solution. You have to get a settlement. And we've seen that there were attempts at this, that uh, we know that uh, within weeks of the war beginning, uh, Ukraine and, and Russia were negotiating first in Belarus and then in Turkey. They had a, a draft 15 point plan uh, that Vladimir Putin uh, displayed uh, a week or two ago. Uh, you know, and, and, and this is not RT or Matt Ho saying this. This was reported by Reuters. This was reported by BBC. This is reported by the Financial Times at the time. It was conveniently forgotten what seems to then have occurred. The U.S. and NATO, particularly the Brits, uh, went to Kiev and said, you will not do this. We will get you victory. You will win this war. And yeah. so rather having a deal, which would have been a deal that would have with Moscow would have withdrawn its forces. You would have had basically the same uh, structures put in place that were, we had underneath the Minsk II Accords, which were brought about in 2015, following the coup in Kiev, following Russia's seizure of Crimea, following uh, the explosion of the war in the East, uh, you would have basically had the same deal struck. You also would have had uh, Ukraine uh, taking on a degree of neutrality, but receiving security guarantees. So security guarantees similar to what the U.S. has with South Korea and Japan, say. So very serious security guarantees. That was what the deal was in hand back in April or back in, in late March. Uh, and it was scuttled. But that shows us that there are opportunities to talk that both sides see an advantage or at least an escape or at least some way of getting out of this war that is a benefit to them. Because I, I think if they are uh, considering where they're at now, uh, they realize that this war can only continue in stalemate and that the potential outcomes from that are either, you know, this ruinous war that just continues. And, and then, then what do you win? If you win in eastern Ukraine, what have you won? You've won a land that is depopulated, right? People have left it. You've let a, a land that is completely destroyed. The infrastructure is, is gone. And you've, land, you've got a land that is polluted. Because what we see in modern yeah. warfare is that the toxins of modern warfare pollute the soil, the water, and the land. And that's a lasting, deadly effect. So if you look at the wars in Southeast Asia, uh, the American wars in Southeast Asia, in, in Afghanistan, uh, in, in Iraq, you see the effect that that war has had on current generations and will have on current generations, whether it's deadly and terrible birth defects or it's the fact that the ground is littered 
with unexplored ordnance and landmines. One of the things you see in this fighting is how heavily, how prevalent the use of landmines are in this war. And those mines are going to be in the ground for a very long time until they're taken out, right? I mean, yeah. and that's a huge effort. So anyway, all I have to say, what do you win if you continue this war? What do you actually win other than the chance to say that? And now you're talking about your moral righteousness. Again, now because it's become that agent of the war's destruction. And one of the more frightening aspects of this was the number of nuclear power plants that Ukraine had and that we learned about as the war kicked off and everybody's, you know, freaking out and saying, you know, oh, Russia's bombing this. Uh, and, uh, you know, like, I think it's just a fact of the battlefield that this fighting is going to occur nearby. It should be even more incentive to try and bring a settlement so that there isn't a uh, kind of a worse disaster. And then, you know, you have uh, to use the cliche, the fog of war. Can can we really know what is happening? They claim that there aren't leaks, but are there really leaks happening? You know, and it's it's hard to trust the information. And I wanted to just ask you briefly, I think this might be as an event mostly behind us, though I don't know, but I saw that you did a bit of a thread on the Wagner mutiny. And there are a lot of, uh, you know, so my mom called me and she was, Usually she wouldn't call me just out of the blue to speak to me about a news event, even though that's what I do as a journalist. But she calls me and she goes, I know you're getting ready. to." I was coming home to visit her that, that weekend. And she says, but uh, a coup in Russia? And I said, what are you talking about? Because I, I had no idea. I had, I had tuned out from the prestige media. I didn't know what was unfolding that basically every single channel had people thinking that at any moment, Vladimir Putin was going to have to relinquish his power mm -hmm. and he would be taken over by this paramilitary group that was trying to, uh, I, 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 from what I understood from my mother is you could be run out of Moscow. And I was like, that sounds crazy. I don't think anything like that's happening. Uh, and then she said, do you think it could happen? I, well, no, actually, I, that doesn't make any sense to me. I, I don't see why that would happen. And and like, as it turns out, it just sort of like went away. I'm not really sure that I fully understand what unfolded other than the fact that it's clear there was some kind of internal conflict between the two parties. But um all the media was really desperate to squeeze this into something that they could get people to see as uh, like a big breakthrough for the war effort in Ukraine. But I'm also mindful that it's coming at a time when we've we've heard all about the Ukrainian counteroffensive that they needed to mount. And there's been reporting that I've seen that it isn't actually going as well as they would like. So then out of the blue, we see this you know, Wagner group is taking on Putin and I'm, I have low information. I'm waiting. I'm, I'll let you come back in and give your more expert opinion, but it just seemed like the confluence, the fact that this is happening at the same time may not have been an accident. Yeah. Well, I mean, let me first just go back, go to the counteroffensive, uh, which we should just call an offensive at this point because it gets silly. Counteroffensives, countering, 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 countering offensives. You go on offensives in war, um, you know. Uh, so it is not, from what I've seen, it's now in its third week. Uh, it is certainly not going uh, the way that those in the West and in Ukraine and Kiev had hoped it would. Uh, certainly is not living up to the expectations, the hype. Uh, this I'm sure there are plenty of people in uh, D.C. and London and Kiev who for the months leading up to this offensive were jumping up and down saying, shut up about it. And at some point and at one point, actually, you had uh, uh, seeing your Ukrainian military officials in the weeks leading up to the offensive saying this might not be as big a deal as everyone makes it out to be. And just actually in this past past couple of days, past few days, the Ukrainian, the Ukrainians have come out and say, you know, it may not be a big offensive. It might be smaller offensive that when you add them up, it's a big offensive. So, I mean, what you've seen, though, is you, you see that the Russians uh, and this is why I think there's a chance for a settlement. 
and it's not going to get you a settlement or, or, or it's not going to deliver a deal that could have been had a year ago. Probably not a deal that could have been had uh, six months ago when uh, the U.S. chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, was saying this is the best time to go get a deal. You know, we, we, let's not forget that the seeing a U.S. military officer back in the fall was saying we should be going for a deal now. Uh, so I think what you're going to get, what you've had is you've had Russia had a chance to set in the defense and they've built very elaborate, strong fortifications, positions that go for, you know, dozens and dozens of miles of layered defense. And they've had people say, why were why was why was Russia using these Wagner mercenary forces in Bakhmut? Why weren't they using the regular army? Well, for a few reasons. One, you had uh, uh, the chance to use convict uh, 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 convict soldiers rather than your own regular army soldiers. And as the head of Wagner Pergosian reportedly said to someone, would you rather have prisoners die or your children die? I mean, so you had that. But you also had the, the, the opportunity to, to keep your regular army in reserve and allow them to build these defenses that the Ukrainians haven't even reached yet. So three weeks in, and they've committed several b- brigades into this fight, and they've got more they can put into it. But they've not been able to do much more than advance into uh, what is basically a security zone, a dead man's land that exists between the two armies that is lightly defended, but is purposely lightly defended. Because the idea is when you have a defense in depth like this, that you want to have a long uh, you want to have an elongated section in front of you that allows for you to identify the army, uh, identifying the approaching army and target it and beginning to break it up right? Disrupt it before it reaches your main lines of defense. You want them to attack you the way you want them to attack you, right? So you, so you channelize them, you canalize them, if I put my old Marine Corps hat back on, right? And, 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 and you know, that's what you're seeing here. And of course, the, one of the big issues for the Ukrainians, they don't have, they're following doctrine. They're following, this is how the United States would attack a defense in depth. The problem is, is the Ukrainians don't have the air support that the United States would have. They don't have the artillery or the rocket or missile fires, uh, the volume of them that the United States would have. So when you go and attack uh, into a defense, the first two things you're supposed to do is uh, suppress and obscure. uh, And you just see the Ukrainians unable to do that because they just don't have the aircraft. They don't have the artillery volume that they need. Uh, So I, I think what you've seen, though, is that because before this mutiny occurred with the Wagner forces, what you had before that, remember, was the dam which most people have started talking about. And you had the dam uh, in, in Kherson uh, destroyed, blown up. Uh, I don't know by who. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever know. I mean, maybe at some point in the future, uh, we will. Uh, but both sides benefited from the dam being blown up. Both sides got hurt by the dam being blown up. I tend to think that the Russians have more to lose by blowing up the dam. But, you know, hey, you, you don't, I don't know. So what I think you're going to see now go for Kevin, is kind of getting your point about this mutiny, this coup, whatever you want to call it, is that there will be uh, an event of the week or an event of the of the of a bi-monthly event that gets everyone talking about it, gets everyone looking at that as opposed to the overall war, right? As opposed, because one of the things you, you got to do, I think, when you observe war, when you look at this, is you want to look at the trend. You want to look at what's occurring over the midterm or the long term. What has been the reality of the war over months? I mean, if you were to look at this war, as so many Western commentators do, by looking at what's occurring, and actually, too, the the Russians have their fair share of of commentators who are nothing but propaganda outlets for them as well. Um, They get all excited about daily occurrences. Two tanks were blown up. This helicopter was shot down. and, And that doesn't matter in the long run. You know, that doesn't matter in the long term. And that's what you got to be looking at. And I think that's why many of us look at this war and say it's stalemated the, over what we've deserved last 15, 16 months of what's possible, what has been done, what can be achieved, what the, say, the manufacturing output of Europe and the U.S. is for 155 millimeter artillery shells on and on and on. You get to this point where you say it's stalemated. And, you know, with this this mutiny that occurred, uh, we're still finding out about it. But I think the performance of uh, the U.S. media, uh, I'm not sure how bad the European media was, but the U.S. media over the weekend was uh, uh, laughably atrocious, uh, 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 you know, observably uh, ridiculous. 
uh, moon, of, moon of Alabama, which is a, you know, generally a great site uh, that I go to uh, learn a lot from them, have been learning from them for years or, you know, um, you know, they, they did a review of what eight separate columnists in the Washington Post said about this and just just uh, uh, just terribly wrong, terribly wrong in the sense that uh, they're just trying to pull together some way to make this look bad for the Russians. And it looks bad for the Russians regardless. Look, no matter how many troops were on the road to Moscow, no matter what was going on, no matter the outcome, the fact that a mercenary army of, you know, I've seen everywhere from 2,000 to 6,000 soldiers was on the road to Moscow and was 200 kilometers from Moscow. Whatever way you look at it, that's bad. That's problematic. No matter how you try and spin it. But to make it into something that this is the death knell for uh, Vladimir Putin, that this shows mass discontent, uh, you know, that the people of Russia are going to be marching on the Kremlin like we did on the Pentagon in 1968. You know what I mean, like those types of statements are just just ludicrous. They, you know, I'm stuck on that word, I guess. But, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, reality is, is it was. And this is one of the things about war is that war will do this. There will be unintended consequences, things that are un you're unable to predict that are unknowable. And that, again, will be uh, part of this, uh, you know, force of nature of war uh, that is, un that is um, on its own agenda. And uh, no matter how you look at it, it's problematic. At the same time, too, I won't say that this is the death knell for Vladimir Putin, his, his regime. Uh, I thought Putin handled this really pretty well uh, in the sense that he got on the phone with Lukashenko, he, the president of, of Belarus, and he said, I'm not talking to this guy. You handle it. Let him know we're going to kill him if he advances any farther. And he took care of it within 24 hours with a minimal loss of life. I mean, that column had reached Moscow. You could have had a lot of death, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of destruction. I mean, that would have been, that would have been again, a, a, a very difficult thing for Russia to accept, internalize and deal with. So this is a big deal, but the way that Putin handled it, the way his government handled it, shows that they're probably in more control, they're probably more secure than we believe, and they're definitely more secure and more control than any of the talking heads, the pundits, the columnists, uh, the, the, the fabulous, because that's what so many of these Western commentators are, fabulous, uh, you know, say about the war. Yeah, and earlier you, you made an important point about how it's really difficult to take what I think is a reasoned position on the war in Ukraine and assess all the risks and try to plead for de-escalation and, and make the case for that as you do in your work. And, you know, part of that, according to people who are Arabs, is because of who is in Ukraine. There has been a like racial mm. element to understanding why we now have reporting that will discuss what war crimes are and what crimes against humanity are as they are committed. And, you know, there are people who have been blown over by the media coverage that attends to incidents in Ukraine that you could never get, never get constant media coverage of in the war in Iraq or the war in Afghanistan. So this is my point where I bring in that I'd like to highlight this coverage of defense contractor funded think tanks that have dominated. I don't know if you can call it the Ukraine debate, but I'll, that is what they titled their report. But I think it's just dominate Ukraine media coverage, dominate our understanding of the war in Ukraine, there isn't much debate over the war in Ukraine. So uh, this is from the Quincy Institute. Ben Freeman worked on it. This came out in May. And I'm just going to quickly go through some of the highlights, and then you can, you can give your reaction as somebody who is from the peace side of things when it comes to trying to influence the media. So we have that the vast majority of media mentions of think tanks and articles about U.S. arms and the Ukraine war are from think tanks whose funders profit from U.S. military spending, arms sales, and in many cases directly from U.S. involvement in the Ukraine war. 
No, no, I'll just quickly highlight these three points. We have that about um, 85% of the time, um, these articles that are related to U.S. military involvement in Ukraine are coming from media outlets that have uh, cited think tanks that have financial backing from the defense industry. I'm going to say military industry. Military industry. Uh, the general trend, there is a trend towards donor transparency, but several of these think tanks refuse to tell people where they get their funds. Also, you have media outlets that are rarely identifying the conflicts of interest that are posed by these experts they are citing. Now, these are the lists. These are the yeah. people who are being asked and invited to uh, supply us the coverage. They come from Brookings Institution, Carnegie Endowment for Inter International Peace, Center for Strategic and International Studies, which most people would probably recognize by their acronym CSIS. Wilson Center, Rand Corporation, Atlantic Council, Council on Foreign Relations, the Center for American Progress, allegedly a progressive think tank, but skeptical of that when it comes to foreign policy. And then the Hudson Institute. Uh, and then there, these are further, they have uh, more that they list here. And they also note who discloses their donors, who doesn't, who is being funded. Um, you look at these top think tanks, um, all of them get military contractor fu contractor funds. Uh, eight of the top 10 think tanks in the world all report funding from nuclear weapons makers or maintainers. How are you going to get them to raise the alarm about the threat of nuclear war if you know they are dependent on those? So of the 27 think tanks where donor information was obtained, more than two thirds received funding from the Pentagon or a Pentagon contractor. And then this part here, this is the last yeah. thing to show you is here's the part that's really important. So they looked at the uh, question. Of, they examined this question. Are military contractor funded think tanks dominating the debate about appropriate U.S. military responses to the Ukraine war? Then they looked at the mentions of these think tanks, the one that are listed on the screen in the New York Times, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal from March 1st, 2022. So after the invasion, just right after through to January 31st, 2023. And here we have uh, CSIS leading with 157 mentions, Atlantic Council at the top. Human Rights Watch is kind of an anomaly that they address. So we can sort of throw that out because... I mean, it's mostly there because of the phenomenon that I talked about earlier of, oh, these are actually victims of war that we mm -hmm. care about. So we'll have coverage right. of human rights abuses and war crimes. Uh, but then you have these other think tanks that are being given all this ink, basically. Media outlets are more than seven times as likely to cite a think tank with defense sector support as they were to cite a think tank without it. Uh, so anyways, I'll let you get back in here and give your uh, your comment, your response to the dominance of these think tanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that Ben and, and, and Quincy did this. Uh, and there's been other reports like this um, earlier on in this Ukraine war. Uh, the Intercept uh, did a did a study and they, they wrote a report as well or put an article out about the prevalence of arms contractors on the Sunday morning talk shows. And I mean, this is something that has been going on for a long time. Uh, an organization called, uh, I can't remember if they're called the Sunshine Foundation or the Sunlight Foundation. They did a, they did a story like this uh, years ago about Syria. And the same numbers, 85, 90% of those who go on uh, CNN, MSNBC, or quoted in the Post or quoted in the Journal or whatever, are people who are directly or indirectly paid for by the Pentagon, whether it's direct or it's through the arms contractors. You know, the, the uh, influence of think tanks is not something that happened accidentally. Uh, this isn't something that came about organically. Uh, this, you know, there's some, I won't go into it, but people want to look this up. You Google Newt Gingrich's role in this in the 90s. Uh, making sure the think tanks were much more prevalent, have much more power, have much more influence in Washington, D.C. And it's a kind of bit of a fascinating story. But the result you have now, of course, is these think tanks that are, uh, uh, of course, biased because of their funding. Uh, but also, too, they have a role that is very outsized. 
So it's not just going on to the television networks. It's not just being the ones who uh, the, jur the journalists from the New York Times call, uh, but it's also to their role in Congress. Uh, you know, a number of years ago, about 10 years or so ago, maybe more than that, uh, I had a, a, a staffer for uh, Senator Bob Casey of Pennsylvania, who is on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, tell me that seven out of 10 briefings the Senate Foreign Relations Committee gets comes from think tanks. And it's from the think tanks you're talking about there. If people watch a House Armed Services Committee hearing or, defense, or a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing and they have graphics, they've got a map up or a chart, very often you'll see in the bottom of that chart is that it was prepared for and provided, provided by the Institute for Study of War or the Center for New American Security. So you also have it then extending into other things. If Facebook wants to fact check you, Kevin, about whether or not, say, Julian Assange is a journalist, who do they use? They use the Atlantic Council for those types of things, right? So how nefarious and insidious this is and how deep it is, is something that um, I don't know if people really appreciate, right? Because the amount of money involved, that's easy to, to get. But the idea of the culture that exists, how this is all just a uh, self-reinforcing culture, uh, that uh, it is uh, a kind of a, uh, not even an echo chamber, but it's, uh, uh, you know, one of those, uh, uh, it's, very, it's an insular ecosystem. Uh, and this is, you know, this extends beyond war and national security and weapons. And this is the same thing you get if you talk about big agriculture, certainly the same thing you get if you talk about healthcare, talk about pharmacy, uh, big, ph you know, pharma, you know, all the economy, uh, the fi finances, you know, these are the same types of things you run into where it's a closed club that gets to talk about it, gets to make decisions, and ultimately are the ones who get the money. And I think this is why it's so apparent to so many of us that DC is a bubble. But this is what you have. You have a self-reinforcing bubble that is funded to the tunes of hundreds of billions of dollars every year. Look, the, the defense budget this year will be $886 billion, right? So let's, let's just call it $900 billion. Make it easy. Uh, half of that goes to contractors. Half of that goes to weapons makers. So $450 billion goes to weapons makers. Of that, the top five weapons makers, Lockheed, Raytheon, Boeing, General Dynamics, I uh, can't remember who the other one is, uh, they get half of that. So a quarter of that $900 billion goes to just five weapons makers. And the amount of that money, what you can do with that, and what you can do is you can fund 50 think tanks in Washington, D.C. that talk about foreign policy and national security and get them to say whatever you want them to say, because if they don't say what you want, they want you to say, well, they'll just move on to somebody else. So and then, of course, that's what Congress hears. So then Congress, of course, appropriates more money for the defense industry, uh, Defense Department of Defense Industry. That money goes back into the think tanks. And this is how you have that loop. Right. So, I mean, this is something that that is uh, very, very rotten and very corrupt. Uh, but this is also a way to help explain why do we have a constant state of warfare? Why do we have a militarized foreign policy? Why do we have a militarized economy? You know, why do we have this militarized country? All right. So I got two things I want to throw at you quickly. Um, I don't know if you have to run, but mm -hmm. uh, I, first, this is the I haven't talked to you since uh, Daniel Ellsberg died. Mm -hmm. And uh, wanted to give you an opportunity if you had anything you wanted to say about him. But in particular, I thought, given our discussion, uh, and because I also have an upcoming podcast episode for Unauthorized Disclosure, where I interviewed Norman Solomon, uh, I just wanted to, and this is his book, uh, War Made Invisible. I know you did an event yeah, with- my, Got my copy right Norman. here. <laughs> yeah, let's let's all wave it around. I mean- it's a good work and it's a really excellent follow-up to his first book, right. War Made Easy. And uh, he has a section of his book where he gets uh, Ellsberg's opinion of what would happen if some of this imagery of war was actually shown to mm -hmm. people here in the United States. And he's talking to him before the war in Ukraine. So now the imagery of the war in Ukraine 
is shown and people are able to access a lot of images of the destruction. They're able to see the refugees who have fled. They're able to see the pain and suffering of Ukrainians. So that's not really a problem for the war in Ukraine because, you know, they uh, were not the aggressor in the war in Ukraine. But Ellsberg said, and I, I just wanted to read this, but this is the last part of his comment when he discusses the media and war. He says, virtually every president tells us or reassures us that we are a very peace-loving people, very slow to go to war, very reluctant, perhaps too slow in some cases, but very determined once we're in. But it takes a lot to get us to accept the idea of going to war, that that's not our normal state. That, of course, does go against the fact that we've been at war almost continuously. And also, I'm going to go ahead and put Dan up on the screen. Uh, that there is deception. That the public is evidently misled by it early in the game, in the approach to the war, in a way that encourages them to accept a war and support a war, is the reality. How much of a role does the media actually play in this, in deceiving the public? And how difficult is it to deceive the public? I would say, as a former insider, one becomes aware. It's not difficult to deceive them. First of all, you're often telling them what they would like to believe, that we're better than other people, we are superior in our morality and our perceptions of the world. So that's just part of it. For the full quote, you'll have to get Norman Solomon's book. But uh, that was just some of the realism and insights that Dan had to offer. So um, I'll let you, you know, say whatever you might like to that comment and Dan in general. Yeah. I mean, first with, with Dan uh, and you wrote a really great piece about him. Uh, I really, I really appreciate that. You got to his, you know, I think a lot of us will say uh, a lot of people will say he's the smartest person they ever met. And he was incredibly intelligent uh, just, just as Julian Assange uh, the same way too. If you meet him, you just, that intelligence that comes off, you see it in his eyes, you know, but also too, and then the courage, of course, is, you know, without, but the, uh, his graciousness, his generosity, his kindness, his modesty, uh, you know, this was not a man who saw him at the top of, uh, saw himself as at the top of any type of hierarchy or anything. Uh, and he was just a wonderful, loving, uh, uh, person. And, uh, whether or not he had been, a, uh, I, I think Dan would say that idea though, this that who he is and what he was uh, was why he did it because so many of, of 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 those who are wasted in war, so many of those who are killed in war, have that opportunity to be kind and generous and gracious, to do great things for their communities, to do great things for their 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 uh, uh, their own people, whether it be the families, whether it be their neighbors, whether it be their country men and women what have you right so but this idea of the waste of war you know and i think that's what dan got back to at least i felt continually was the waste of it and the waste made all the worst by the deceit of it and the deceit is necessary because it's a waste right so if, if people see what's really going on and i i think the the powers that be whatever you want to call the establishment those who wage war they, they're a living organism they evolve they adapt and I mean, one of the things we saw with the Iraq and Afghan wars was how terribly unpopular they were. And then the political effect that had, right? We get the first black president of the United States because of the Iraq war. I mean, like the, the political. And so by the time you get into Obama's second president, second term of the presidency, though, the United States military, the White House, uh, they've understood that we cannot have these land wars. There's too much of a political uh, uh, detriment to them. They may start off great. People may be all for them. You may have a 75% approval rating, 80% approval rating. All the cable networks will have a little American flag fluttering in the corner, you know, when you go off to triumph over the Iraqis. But it's going to fall apart. And so this idea then of becoming of having proxy wars. But also, too, I think what they have done so well, because you have to be deceitful and you have to hide it. And in order to do that, you have to have people be emotional, too. And one of the things I see with this war in Ukraine is the way that Vladimir Putin has been made into a bigger villain than Osama bin Laden ever was. 
Mm -hmm. So the emotional connection between people with this war is unlike anything I feel I I saw with the Iraq war or the Afghan war, uh, I, you know, in terms of the public's reaction to it and the public's adherence to, you know, and you could say things to people and it just, it just, um, they're not phased by it because there is such a uh, vilification and rightfully so. This is not, I mean, Vladimir Putin, you know, is, a, is an authoritarian uh, leader. I mean, he's, he's, he's no one that I'm ever going to say, I like that guy. No one I'm ever going to point to and say, that's a guy who I admire. Right. And he's a war criminal, just as Bush and Cheney and Obama and Trump, they are war criminals. Uh -huh. So but the idea, though, that you can get people to have such an emotional state that they persist in supporting the war, I think, is something that has been worked upon and really finely tuned in this case. Uh, so uh, but, you know, Dan's what, what Dan did, I think, for so many of us was, uh, you know, provide just a basic understanding of what we're up against. And to so many of us, he was a mentor. So many of us, he was someone that you could talk to about these things who had a perspective that was greater than anything, you know, you or I could have just, you know, for a variety of reasons. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, his loss is, is really, really felt. But at the same time, too, he lives on in this. I mean, I, I really if you're watching this. Go and read Kevin's Kevin's uh, article on Dan, uh, on Dan Ellsberg, uh, you know, and the effect that you get from that understanding what the effect that Dan had on Kevin and how that will be with Kevin forever. The way he had an effect on me, the way he's had an effect on so many other people, people he met and people he never met. And I mean, that type of legacy. Uh, and, and we need that because what we're up against, of course, is a Leviathan that, as we've talked about, is very well funded, very well resourced, has all the think tanks and the medias and the, the banks and the fossil fuel companies behind and everything else. What we're up against is a Leviathan. And we need that type of uh, metaphysical presence that Dan Ellsberg was uh, if we're going to ever, ever uh, have any form of victory, let alone if we're going to persevere. Yeah, you've been really generous with your time, but I feel like it's important if you if you could take a minute here before I get to my last thing uh, to just say, uh, did Dan reach out to you when he saw you come forward? You 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 send the letter, you leave the State Department and and, and protest. I yeah. mean, were you one of those people who Dan noticed in the news, and then he gives you a phone call and wants to hear from you? Yeah, right away, right away, within a few days of my big Washington Post story. And then if people aren't aware, I had a, uh, when I resigned from the State Department, it ends up in the Washington Post. Uh, front page, above the fold, big deal. I become like a media darling for months. I'm on CNN and MSNBC and Fox, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But within days, Dan had called me. And I I'll always remember where I was. Uh, I was standing in the, the, the Union, Union train state, Union, Union station, the train station in Washington, D.C. at the Aubon Pond, uh, getting a coffee and something to eat. And I was either, I can't remember if I was going to New York or coming back from New York or what it was, but answering the phone, uh, I guess back in the days when we still answered our phone from unknown numbers, and uh, it was Dan Ellsberg. And the first thing he, he asked me about was whether or not I had any documents. Uh, which gets to your point, Kevin, about what you had said about Dan and uh, people needing to witness the war, people needing to understand the war. And I think that's what he was communicating to me. Did you bring any documents with you back from Afghanistan? I didn't, because when I quit uh, the war, uh, it wasn't a it was meant for me to leave it. And so the idea of bringing back any type of documents that would have proved or vindicated what I was saying was wasn't anything that I had been thinking about. Um, but, you know, right away, he became uh, a mentor to me, a friend, uh, you know, an elder, uh, if you will. And within a couple of weeks of that, I met him in person. And I have a photograph on my wall here of him and I sitting together from that that first meeting. And since then, uh, he has been a very important person in my life. Uh, someone I'd speak to a few times a year. I hadn't seen him since before the pandemic, uh, you yeah. know, but uh, certainly I was, I was very fortunate, very lucky that I got to talk to him uh, uh, in May. Uh, so uh, yeah, very grateful for that uh, last chance to speak with him. And, and again, the generosity 
that he displayed, the kindness, the willingness to talk to me. I was always so amazed about him, uh, about Dan, was the fact that he wanted to talk about you. He wanted to learn from you. And again, this is the smartest, most courageous person I've ever met. And he wants to talk about me, right? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, right. That was who he was, though. It, but, it, I mean, it also goes to show the strength of his, of his character, the integrity of his intelligence that he always knew he always had to keep learning. He always had to keep talking to people, right? You know, I mean, so there's so many things that, you know, I feel blessed for, for having had that opportunity with, with Dan. And one is learning, okay, if you're going to be in this role, if you're going to try and advocate for something publicly, you better know what you're talking about. And it's always a lifetime of learning. You need to talk with all kinds of people, whether you agree with them or not, you need to listen to them, watch them, you know? And so all these different things that as I have this opportunity to talk about Dan, you know, come back to me. And so I, I appreciate Kevin, you giving me the opportunity to say all this because, you know, even though it's of course a loss, uh, you know, the, the feeling that you have from having someone in your life like that, being able to have that interaction with greatness, if you will, if I can use that type of cliche, uh, is, you know, I'm, I'm, thank you for allowing me to talk about it. Well, and, uh, you know, John Kiriakou called him the godfather of whistleblowers. And I mean, he really was that guy that whenever somebody wanted to come forward, he was there to support them. And, and now, you know, oh, yes. I, I think of the people who are without Dan and most importantly, I say a word, we mentioned Julian Assange's name. I say a word for Daniel Hale in right. uh, the CMU who was having uh, frequent and regular conversations with Dan Ellsberg is one of the few people he could put on his list who he would be able to talk to every other week or however often yeah. they allow you to. And now Dan's not there for these conversations to lend his moral support. So uh, I have one extracurricular thing to ask of you, and then I'll let you go. If you if you would put on your Green Party hat as, as someone, I, I really would appreciate it if you could give me just a few minutes and respond to this uh, buffoonery going around <laughs> about um, chastising voters that uh -huh. has been circulating in the last 24 hours. Um, and just because I know you're, uh, you know, you're, you know, you're an authority on yep. this. Um, I just want to play this for people because this is, you know, I, I'm floored by what this person is saying. And I think it goes to a lot that we've talked about that is kept off the table deliberately. And then we'll sign off here. So this is pod save America. I don't know which bro this guy is personally. Um, but all of these, men at one point or another worked for the Obama administration. So here is, um, I think his name's John. This is him speaking and he's talking about voting in 2024. People who voted for Jill Stein, just Jill Stein in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania had voted for Hillary instead. Donald Trump would have never become president. That's it. Right. And so, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of Cornell West fans out there. Um, you live in a swing state vote for Cornell West, you're helping Trump become president. That's it. And you can say, oh, well, it's Joe Biden's fault. He did this or that. No, no, no. It's, it's your decision. You get to decide whether you want to help Donald Trump become president or you don't. And if you want to help him, then you should vote for Cornell West or you should vote for Joe Manchin and his no <laughs> or you can vote for, you know, RFK Jr. if he decides to run third vote. But if you don't want to help Trump become president, you got to vote for Joe Biden. That's it. Very simple. Now, I think messaging to voters who might actually make this decision is probably a little different, I would say, because I no chastising work. <laughs> <laughs> like, I do think you need to explain why these candidates would yes. not be good candidates for president. I really do, because I and I and I think we could get tripped up in that, because I think if, if you are one of these voters and you hear a bunch of people yelling at you to vote for Joe Biden and because you have to, I don't think it's going to be very effective. And I think you have to say why RFK Jr. is not a good choice, why Cornell West is not a good choice, why Joe Manchin or whoever it may be is not a good choice. So that is something that I think Democrats are going to have to figure out in the next year. Uh, finally. All right. Well, uh, 
if we if we could conclude here, uh, I just uh, I can't believe election madness has already started. Normally, I don't have to deal with this nonsense until January or February, but they're starting early because um, Joe Biden doesn't take care of any of the issues we talked about on this program. He doesn't do anything when it comes to ending war. He's not attuned to the climate emergency. And so you get this. So um, maybe you want to just, uh, you know, briefly say why uh, breaking the duopoly is an option. And then uh, we can say goodbye to everyone. Yeah, I mean, let me just address the whole Stein 2016, you know, uh, it, it's it's incorrect. You know, you look at the exit polls from 2016, which you uh, you can present that to these people and they ignore it because they have no interest in in being factually correct. It's just partisanship. Uh, and these are people we should point out who are not affected by rising home costs, who are not affected by rising food costs, who are not affected by the horror show that is the American healthcare system. And these are the people who believe they will be okay from climate change. As long as they go along and get along, as long as Ben Rhodes and Tommy Vidar and whoever that clown was uh, say the right things, they will always be in the bubble. And that's why they have to preserve the duopoly. If they don't have a system of A and B, if you have a true democratic system, well, then your carefully manicured and manufactured uh, system we have now, where one party gets half the governor's houses, the other party gets the other half of the governor houses, the state legislatures are roughly split. There's a clear red-blue divide in the country. We get this part. You get this part. The White House changes over every four or eight years. The House and Senate change over every two years sometimes. I mean, so the, the going is good. These are guys, those people on Pod Save America are guys who view the gravy train as having biscuit wheels that they are riding on. So there's no, they have no interest in a discussion about whether what's the best thing for our democracy, what's the best thing for the tens and tens and tens of millions of people who are excluded from our political process, uh, you know, let alone the actual facts. And just to what I'm talking about with the 2016 Stein case is that the exit polls from 2016 showed that 61 percent of Stein voters would not have voted at all for president. And 25 percent would have voted for Clinton and 15 percent would have voted for Trump. So the math doesn't work. And Gary Johnson, it's about the same. About hmm. 60% of Gary Johnson voters wouldn't have voted. 25% would have voted for Clinton and 15% would have voted for Trump. So the, the numbers, it doesn't, the math doesn't add up, but it, that's, it's irrelevant to these people. And the other thing where you see why this is all just a con why this is all just a partisan uh, rhetoric, why he, the one, one guy was so quick to say chastising works uh, is because they never argue for anything that would help address this spoiler issue. They never address for anything that would help uh, address this stealing of elections by third party candidates or you know any, any of those kinds of things, in particular, say ranked choice voting, which would address this. Or, you know, God forbid, you go to proportional representation in terms of our legislatures. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I mean, on and on. We could, I could do a whole show with you on this. Yeah, yeah. Where I am, it, that. But, but I appreciate your time, Kevin. I really appreciate everyone watching. And like I said, read Kevin's article on Dan Ellsberg. I, I thought it was really one of the best. Uh, tell people where they can um, find your work, and then uh, we'll we'll sign off. Sure, uh, I'm with the Eisenhower Media Network, uh, so you can look us up online, Eisenhower Media Network. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Matthew P. Ho, P as in Patrick. And then I have a Substack, uh, Matthew Ho at Substack or whatever it is. I don't know. Okay. I probably Great. It, was, it was good to talk with you all. And um, thank you for tuning in and uh, stay tuned to this channel for more conversations like this one.